and uh, said, through a loudspeaker system, said, attention, this would be Tommy Henry's last appearance at the plate for the New York Yankees for the duration of the war. Well, the genius crossed, he gave me a great big hand, and I, I was surprised, and I back out of there, and I said, yeah, yeah, you're fine. And then I go back in, and Dizzy Trout is a pitcher, and I said, come on, let's go. And he says, Tom, enjoy this. He says, this happens once in your lifetime. Give us a little context on uh, the war and the game during that particular time. Yes, sir, I'd be happy to, Gene. Uh, the, uh, both baseball and, and the baseball players made significant contributions to to our success in World War II. The sport ex ex itself continued uh, at the urging of President Roosevelt, who considered it a morale booster for the home front and also for the men and women in uniform. And uh, so he gave what is called the green light to allow baseball to continue during the war. Um, but beyond that, the men who had made the sport great before the war also made unique contributions of their own. More than 500 Major League Baseball players served in the military during World War II, along with 4,000 minor leaguers uh, and members of the Negro Leagues. Let me uh, ask uh, our uh, historian uh, here, uh, Bob Linder, about something that uh, Bill Goldberg said early, that uh, the president wanted the game to continue because he thought that it was good for the morale of the American people. Uh, is there any really, uh, evidence to uh, support the fact that uh, the, um, did the crowd still turn out uh, in the same way, despite the fact that many of the stars were gone and not playing? The crowds turned out. Uh, the St. Louis Browns never had much of a crowd before the war and <laughs> continued in the or, vein. Or after. <laughs> you know, right. But for the most part, the crowds turned out. And uh, it's also in this period that Bill Wrigley invented the All-American Girls Base Professional Baseball League which is a great page in our history. It lasted not only through the war, but for several years afterwards. And uh, I think it was a tremendous morale booster for the American people. Baseball's greatest role in American history is it's provided stability. It's provided continuity. It's been with us since 1845, and even World War II couldn't stop it. Uh, the question has been asked over the years, what would these players and, and the other 500 major league players and the minor leaguers and the Negro leaguers have done if there hadn't been a World War II? You know, what, does anybody know exactly what, what they would have, how much greater they would have been? Uh, and there are computerized programs, projections, that average out what, what a player did for his three years before the war and three years after, war, after the war. And you, from that, you establish an annual average. And on that basis... Uh, we know now, for example, Bob Feller would have won another 107 games. That would have given him 49 more wins than Olden Ryan has. Mm -hmm. um, he, would have, um, he would have struck out another 1,100 hitters. Uh, he would have had five new hitters instead of three and 19, <laughs> 19 one hitters instead of 12. 19 <laughs> one hitters. Warren Spahn was a, 13, was a 20 game winner 13 times. He would have done it 15 times if he hadn't had World War II. No, no telling how many home runs he would have done. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Tommy Hendrick would have hit 63 more home runs. Dom DiMaggio and Cecil Travis would be in the 2000 hit club, two great hitters. Um, and, and so it goes. So this this is. You know, they gave up not only years, but they gave up prime years. Mm -hmm. You know, men in their mid-20s and late-20s. Bob, uh, so did you get a chance to, uh, I know you were on ship a, a, a lot of time, uh, I see, uh, but did you get a chance to play any ball at all while you were in? Oh, yes. The answer to that is, of course, I played nor in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, when I went to boot camp down there for the Norfolk team. And uh, I played in Newport, uh, Rhode Island, uh, when I... Went up there for a war college. In fact, I played a little bit, but my farmer's schedule for them. Got them uniformed, got equipment for the training base at Norfolk, where uh, I was going through war college, where the commanding officer was named Redneck Magruder. He was mad at everybody. <laughs> and um, then I went aboard ship and went to North Atlantic, and we played softball in Iceland. Played in Scapa Flow at a British base at the North, in the Arcadias. We played a lot in the South Pacific, where some of the Seabees had used the uh, Bulldozers, uh, of course, uh, Mokone was in the CBs, but he used bulldozers over there in those islands, the uh, New Hebrides, uh, also in the Fijis, and uh, Kwajalein, you know, Wheat Dock, and all the way across. 
Um, and the best ballpark we had was in the Ulithi, which is right southwest of Guam, about five, six hundred miles. I did play ball. I played catch the board at Battleship Alabama. I played ball almost every evening if conditions permitted. A lot of times, of course, we had, had to stand by your gun because of the torpedo bombers that always come in about dusk to try to get to the carriers, and we had to do our, do our job. I did play, and I did play a lot of catch aboard the Battleship Alabama. Well, it must have been pretty intimidating for your average uh, ordinary seaman uh, who's playing on a team, uh, whether it's pickup or not, to come up against you to, well, uh, Bob, on the mound. Bob, didn't, on that point, didn't you tell me that even today there are still dozens of white baseballs bobbing up and down in the Pacific Ocean? Uh, we th- wonder once in a while the ship would roll or preach, and <laughs> I'd miss the catcher and the ball would go overboard. <laughs> right. There's probably a few of those balls on those beaches are so lovely. <laughs> Lovely islands like Peleliu and uh, <laughs> Tarawa, and uh, you can name all the islands out there, Ponape, and uh, uh, you name them all. But uh, I, some of them I don't ever want to see again, but uh, <laughs> I gotta leave we, we, we did the Marianas, and uh, we did the Philippines, and uh, when you took Nero MacArthur back where he wanted to go, I'm no hero. <laughs> they, the heroes didn't come back. We know that. 405,000 of them. That's right. Uh, I, it was a very good honor for me to... Uh, me in the Navy, I enjoyed my, uh, I don't say I enjoyed it, but uh, I'm very proud of my military career. Like all these men here that were in the military, we're proud of the fact that we helped, we, we had the honor and the opportunity to serve our country. Bert Sefford, let me come to you a minute. Well, I took the Air Force exam. You had to have two years of college, but I didn't have that. So I took an, a special exam, which was equal to that. So I was, got called into cadets and was uh, fortunate enough to graduate and fly a P-38. But uh, an interesting thing, when I was in prison camp, uh, every time a new prisoner came in, everybody would rush up, say he's from New York, how are the Yankees do it? How are Brooklyn do it? <laughs> it's amazing the interest baseball had in prison camp. Uh, that was the first thing they'd ask them, how's their favorite team doing? Mm-hmm. So that was rather interesting. Mm-hmm. And tell me about uh, the uh, incident itself. Well, I was over there flying around. I wasn't bothering anybody, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I saw a column of smoke up ahead, and they said, there's some airplanes on there. I said, well, hell, I might as well make a pass on the way back to England, and I was about two miles from it, and uh, uh, I must have flown right over the gun uh, emplacement because they sh- sh- must have shot up and they hit the, shot the right foot off. So I'd call the colonel and told him I had a leg shot off. I'd call him back later. <laughs> well, tell us. <laughs> so yeah, there's no pain or anything. It's just a little numb. And uh, so in the meanwhile, I get hit in the chin. And that knocked me unconscious. A lot of people accuse me of still being unconscious. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, technically the doctors say that I'm okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, then I crashed in the airplane unconscious. Hit her kabank. So um, a German, or Luftwaffe, I mean a Vienna doctor from uh, Austria was in the German Luftwaffe and he was called to come over uh, to take me to the hospital. And uh, he had to chase the farmers away with their pitchforks because they were going to do me in. And uh, uh, he had a pistol with him, so he chased them away. Well, the local hospital wasn't going to take me because I was a terror flicker. See, there's a lot of fighter aircraft, strafe German, a bunch of civilians, and uh, that's a pretty dirty thing. So um, uh, he called a high command in Berlin, and they called the Ludwig Schuss Hospital and said, you take him, you're responsible. So he took me in there, and I woke up a couple weeks later, and he had already left, and I didn't know who had brought me to the hospital until uh, about 50 years later. Is that right? And uh, I was able to fly over to the... um, Harndorf, Austria, and visit with him as the greatest thing that could ever happen to me. Because that had been bothering me. Oh, I'm getting a little old, and uh, I might uh, kick the bucket one of these days. So uh, I was anxious to see him. The great thrill. And when I got ready to leave, he put his arms around me and squeezed real hard. And I had the feeling those were the same arms that picked me up out of that cockpit. Mm-hmm. And I broke down something awful. It was, uh, I, I didn't expect to, but by God, I did. That's a wonderful tale. Yeah. Buck, uh, when you were in the CBs and uh, out in the Pacific, uh, you had left a situation uh, where you were playing in the Negro League, uh, couldn't play in the major leagues. <clears throat> the barrier hadn't been broken yet. Mm-hmm. 
But what was it like for you in the in the in the CBs in that regard? Well, when you think about it, it's still segregation in the CBs. Right. Segregation in the CBs. We were in an all black battalion, and but uh, uh, but uh, all the officers they were white. Mm-hmm. They were white, and uh, it some some of the things that that would happen is I know we went to take some ammunition to uh, a destroyer. And uh, we down here in this LST, we run, uh, uh, we sending the, uh, sending the ammunition up, and it started blowing taps. And the, the little ensign on the deck said, attention, niggas. And when he said that, I went up that ladder. I said, you know what you're saying? Say, I am a Navy man. I just happen to be black. Say, I'm fighting for the same thing you're fighting for. Then they called the captain, and the captain blessed him out. And one thing about it is, when he really started thinking about it, is he started crying. He was from Alabama. He started crying. I said, don't cry. Just don't do it no more. We had people that uh, were let out of prison to go into the service. Uh, We had the dropouts of the Air Force and every other branch of the service. So those are the people I went overseas with and they were tough and rough and uh, you know I had to fit that mold too and uh, we were uh, we were surrounded by the Germans in the Hurricane Forest and uh, we had to fight our way out of there and uh, one of the interesting things that you know relates to baseball is that uh, we had a password among the Americans that uh, who played the Keystone sack for the bums. And if anybody in the United States Army wasn't a baseball fan, they were dead. (laughs) 